Good afternoon. Welcome to the regular Friday program of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club. As is usual, our first order of business is to welcome our new members. Uh, we have two with us today. First is James Fulin, Public Relations Manager of Portland Opera. I'd like for him to stand. We also have Glenda Landgraver, Job Services Representative for the Oregon Employment Division. Glenda, would you stand? Let's give them a warm welcome. The recruiters who helped uh, sign up these new members today uh, were Robert Bailey, and uh, we'd like to thank him for uh, helping us out with a new member. Now a few announcements. Next week we're going to have the first of five ballot measure reports. Last spring the research board began to look at the list of proposed ballot measures and decide which ones we would study. It's not an easy task to pick out the ones we can study. It's almost a balancing act. They do have a list of criteria which guides them in the selection. On that list are things like, is it an issue we've studied before? Can we contribute to the debate? And are public, excuse me, and are important public policy issues raised? It's lots of fun to sit in and listen to that debate because indeed it is a debate. They have selected five for this year and the one we will hear about next week is ballot measure three. This uh, is the one that repeals tax exemption, grants additional benefit payments for PERS retirees. I hope all the club members will read the report and come and participate in the debate next week. I will remind everybody that the club's official position on an issue is based upon the vote of the membership. Following the ballot measure report next week, Tom Troop, chair of the Deschutes County Commission and member of the Land Conservation and Development Commission will speak on managing the growth pains. Oregon's land use system. We'll be back here at U.S. Bank Corp Tower on the 41st floor. Two weeks from today, October 26th, we'll have two ballot measures. They will be printed in the bulletin as usual and then they'll be presented here on that Friday. Following that presentation, our speaker will be the president of the National Center for Family Literacy and the director of the Keenan Trust Family Literacy Project, Sharon Darling. She will speak on Breaking the Cycle of Illiteracy. We will meet here in this room again at the U.S. Bank Corp Tower. As I've mentioned the last couple of weeks, we are offering a leadership development course. It's based on Stephen Covey's work uh, and his book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. It's a principle-centered approach to leadership development. The enrollment is limited to 20 people. There are brochures on the table today for you to look at. If you're interested, you should talk to Nancy Hedin, Executive Director of the club. Our board host today is Lloyd Anderson, member of the Board of Governors. The second question will be asked by Mark Anderson, Chair of the Arts and Culture Standing Committee. As usual, we will open up to members' questions. We'll have a mic in the back of the room. Uh, preference is given to those people who go to the mic to ask their questions, but we also take written questions. If you have them, uh, fill them out. There's forms on your table. A city club staffer will pick them up and bring them to the podium. Remember, though, they are questions, not statements. Now for our program which is co-sponsored by the Oregon Catholic Conference today. Peace is a compelling topic. In my lifetime, it seemed very near to us, but then it somehow escaped from our grasp. On the other hand, it looks like we're driven to declare war on other countries, poverty, and drugs. But we never seem to win a war, nor do we achieve peace. Maybe we're lucky we haven't declared war on the budget deficit, or did we? Our speaker today 
is Mayraid McGuire. She seems to have followed Eleanor Roosevelt's advice. It isn't enough to talk about peace. One must believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it. One must work at it, and work she has. She was one of the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1977 for peace. She began to work toward peace after three members of her family were killed at the height of the violence in Northern Ireland. Perhaps her insight and work to build the community of peace people will help us as we try to find answers to our problems. Please join me in welcoming Mairead McGuire. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a great joy for me to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to first thank the Oregon Catholic Conference for being my host here in the city of Portland. And I would like to thank the Portland City Club for giving me an opportunity to be here with you for a short while and to share with you my dream of a peaceful Northern Ireland and my dream of a peaceful world. Myself and a friend who works in the Peace People have been now here in the west coast of America talking about our work, Community of the Peace People. And we have a saying in Ireland which says, Kid Mil Afushtja, which means a hundred thousand welcomes. And we have been met, every city we have gone to, with our message of nonviolence for the human family. We have been met with 100,000 welcomes. People say they don't know what's happening in Northern Ireland. And when you think of it, they should, because after all, there's nearly as many books written about Northern Ireland as the people that live there. <laughs> you know, it, it is a fact also, you know, that we're quite a tiny place there because we only have one and a half million people, the same population as you have here in Portland. One and a half million people. And you know, some people find different reasons about the conflict in the north of Ireland. They have, the experts have different answers to it. Some people say it is a religious war with Catholics fighting Protestants. That is a myth. It is highly dangerous to put religious tags on the conflicts such as we have in the north of Ireland and in many parts of our world. It is not a religious war in Ireland. But again, if you take religious out of, religion out of the Irish question, you'll never understand it. But in Ireland, we have a situation that is deep coming, its roots are in different social, economic, and cultural mixture, a deeply complex situation. Now down through the last 21 years, we have had a particularly troubled time in our country. In the early 60s, when this, the civil rights movement came out calling for human rights in the north of Ireland, unfortunately, the government did not move fast enough to try to implement some of these problems. The fear that was there, the fear about injustice, and the fear between the two traditions in the north of Ireland erupted onto our streets into violence, as fear, when it is held long enough, has to erupt, and normally it's into violence. And you know, for then, from 69 to 76 in the streets of Belfast in Northern Ireland, that fear was played out in violence and killing coming from both the security forces and illegal organizations. Until in 1976, we found ourselves all on the brink of civil war. And then a tragedy happened only one of all the tragedies which we have had to cope with. 
On the 10th of August 1976, my young sister Anne took four of her children for a walk. There was a clash between the IRA and the Army. The Army shot a young IRA man, Danny Lennon, through the head. His car went up onto the footpath and pinned my sister and her three of her little children against the railings. The following day, as I went through the hospital with my brother-in-law, Jackie, and we looked at his little daughter, Joanne, he had stayed lying dead on the stone slab. And beside her, her little brother, six weeks old, Andrew, dead. And her little, son, her little brother, John, two and a half, dying. And Jackie McGuire looked at his wife, Anne, dying, and the doctor said, we don't think she'll live. We buried the three children. Anne recovered slightly, had two more children, but on a cold winter day, she took her own life, leaving a note to say, forgive me, I can't go on, I love you. You see, it's easy for people to be armchair generals and to talk about war, but I say to you as the American people, we know the price of war in the streets of Belfast. You paid the price of war in Vietnam, and for God's sake now, with the loudest voice you can find, call out that what is happening in the Gulf today be solved through the ways of non-violence. Call out that your government and other governments deal with this Gulf crisis through the United Nations because of militarism is used in the Gulf today. We will weep as your children come back and you bury them as we've had to bury so many of our dead. And we will weep if militarism is used in the Gulf because the West will collapse. And we will weep if militarism is used in the Gulf because you will take away the hope of so many millions of people around the world today. Because you see, there is an alternative to violence and cruelty and war, and we have witnessed this in our own time. We don't have to look back to Gandhi and King, though they are our inspiration and Jesus. In the last 18 months, we have seen in the East millions of our brothers and sisters through the ways of non-violence bring down walls of evil and have their revolution. Non-violence does work. And what better example to the so-called Christian West than what we have witnessed from China? I had the privilege of speaking to Chai Ling, the young girl who led the Chinese pro-democracy movement. And Chai Ling told me how the young Chinese students had pledged themselves to non-violence. How the young Chinese students had said that they would die before they would kill anyone. That they would die before they would hurt anyone. And die they did. And we would be doing the greatest service to the memory of the Chinese students now in prison in China. If we of the so-called Western Christian countries do any less than demand that non-violence be used to solve the Gulf crisis. And wouldn't it be wonderful to the world? Can you imagine what it would mean if a mature democracy like America solved the Middle East conflict through the ways of non-violence? Well then, what would that open to us? Why, it might even mean that we could solve the problem of Israel. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Israel solved the problem of the Palestinian injustice through non-violence and was a light to the world? Wouldn't it be wonderful then that the money that we could save when we bring home your boys and girls from the Middle East and we put that money into tackling the real problems in the human family today? the problems of the environment, the problems of third world poverty. Let's think about it. 
while we sit here eating this beautiful meal. In Ethiopia and Sudan, 10 million of our brothers and sisters are slowly dying. Are we a civilized people who can mobilize thousands of troops, lift them from one country to another, put them on the borders with no expense spared to save our oil? while we can't feed our starving brothers and sisters. If we don't solve this crisis and begin to feed the poor, future generations will look back on shame at us that we could be so cruel, so unimaginative that we couldn't deal with this problem. You know, I pay tribute to the men and women in the Gulf today. Their courage, them being prepared to die for us. I pay tribute to men and women throughout the world who've been prepared to die for us, who have fought wars for us. But what I'm saying is we've got to find another way. If we are just to remain loyal to those who have gone before us, by going on repeating their mistakes, that's not good enough. For the sake of our descendants, we must find a new way if we are to give them hope and save their world. For me, nonviolence is an absolute principle. For the human family, nonviolence is an absolute necessity for survival. In the north of Ireland, we have a problem of two deeply divided communities. You see, Northern Ireland is a microcosm of what's happening around our world. People in Northern Ireland don't hate each other. People in the world don't hate each other. The domineering force in our world today, which we don't fully understand, is that of fear. People are afraid of each other. We are born with fear. We die with fear. But it's all right to be afraid. Being afraid makes you human. People understand when you're afraid. They'll let you make mistakes. They, they help you when you admit to being afraid. But you see, sometimes we don't want to admit to being afraid. We like to act as if we've got our act together, as they say in America. <laughs> but we like to pretend that we have 99.9% .9 of the problem sorted out. And if we get just 1% of the problem, we'll have it all figured out. But you know, it's not like that. We know nothing. We know nothing in compared to what there is to be known. But you know, fear can be used in one or two ways. It can be used in the old way, where if our values are challenged, if our resources are challenged, as in the Gulf, we react in the traditional ways of sending out the troops. That's the old way. But if we can't begin to look at a new way, you see, fear can be transcended. Fear can be turned into courage. The courage to say, I will nonviolently be begin to change me and to change my society and to deal with this problem in a new way the way of non-violence. But you see, we don't know how to operate non-violence. We studied war, but we don't know how to operate non-violence. And those who should have been telling us and teaching us and showing the way have not done so. In Ireland, young, young men take the gun and say, this is an armed struggle. We are fighting a just war and the church is blessed war. For 1,700 years, the churches have indeed blessed war. For 1,700 years, the Christians 
have been unfaithful to the full gospel message of Jesus. And it was simple. No killing. Love your enemy. Do good to them who hate you. And if there is to be hope for Ireland, the Christians and their leaders must proclaim quite clearly there is no such thing as a just war. Jesus' message was simple and clear. And if the great religions in the world teach what their founders wanted to be taught, and this could be a great hope to helping the world. And you see, in Ireland, we have a beautiful tradition of nonviolence. Nonviolence is in our roots. Nonviolence goes back to the word boycott coming from the west coast of Ireland. Nonviolence goes back to Daniel O'Connell, who worked for the poor and never believed in killing. Nonviolence are our real roots. And to those of you who are Irish listening today, be proud to be Irish. But our roots are in nonviolence. What happened in Ireland in 1916, 1922 was a blip in our history. We are a people of peace. But we've got caught in the same traps as other countries have got caught in. You see, in Ireland, we put our nationalism way up on top. And we tuck our Christianity and our common humanity way down in the bottom. And we wave a little flag and we go out and we kill for that flag. Nationalism has destroyed too many people. One has only got to walk through the like of Auschwitz concentration camp, which I did a few years ago. And it's like walking through hell. We have got to begin to put our common humanity above our flags and build a world fit for the human family to live in with the flags and the color of your skin and your politics are never put in front of the human family. In Northern Ireland, through the ways of reconciling our two traditions to recognize they need each other, to work together. You see, Thomas Merton King wrote, the roots of violence are a dulled conscience. How many of us have allowed our conscience to become dulled? And he went on to say, when you allow your conscience to become dulled, you can't see the truth of something with any kind of clarity. So if we are to be peacemakers and to make peace, we must clear our conscience and see with the greatest clarity that we are not just individual little egos, but that we need each other. It is an illusion to think that we do not need each other. And when we recognize that need to find ways of coming together, in the north of Ireland, if I told you that in one small city called Derry, it is divided by a river just like your beautiful Portland today. The river divides on one side the Catholics and on the other side the Protestants. They go to different schools, they go to different clubs, they never meet each other, and the river represents not only a physical barrier, but the barriers up in their mind between each other. Now, we are not any different from other cities. That river may divide them on a social basis. It may divide them on a black and white, a cultural basis. The only difference in Northern Ireland is that our conflicts have erupted into violence in cities like this. As time goes on, as our values are challenged, as the resources get less and less, which of course they will, the way the world is going, if your conflicts are not dealt with now, non-violently. I'm afraid all over our world there's going to be millions of Northern Ireland. So how are we beginning? The first step says you're Dr. Speck, Peck, Speck, <laughs> Dr. Peck, <laughs> sorry, Dr. Peck, 
a, a leading psychiatrist here in America, in his beautiful book, The Different Drum, the first step towards world peace is building genuine community. And how does one build genuine community? By bringing people together on a one-to-one, -one, a two-to-two, -two, a three-to-three, -three, across the river, a city-to-city, -city, a town-to-town, a country to country, Ireland to England, America to Iraq, the Soviet Union to China, the Chinese to the Koreans. I could go on and on. Building the bridges, it's the only way. You see, our security does not lie in building more grotesque weapons and sending militarism into the sky. Adolfo Perez Esquivel said, do not put armaments into the skies. Leave the stars for the lovers. You see, our security lies in becoming friends. And this is how, through our little work program, we literally have to rebuild this fabric of our society and become friends by sending our teenagers from both sides of the river to peace camps to study what peace is all about by then going back to their place in the river and by multiplying that right across both sides of the river so that somehow we are bringing down the fear barriers. Reconciliation, non-violence, working for justice. And perhaps this is one of the greatest challenges facing us in Northern Ireland. I have said it is a myth that we hate each other in Northern Ireland. It is fear that is there. In Northern Ireland, there is a lack of human rights. In Northern Ireland, it is a question of human rights. Our, many of our basic civil liberties have been removed from us. We need to restore the highest standard of justice. You could be lifted in the streets of Belfast by a policeman, and you could be held in an interrogation centre for up to seven days in Northern Ireland. You could sign a confession and find yourself in prison, and tragically, it is a fact that we have in our prison young men who signed confessions for things they didn't do. I know that sounds terrible, and maybe people feel, but how could it happen? But I myself am visiting a young man, 19 years of age. He was in the Ulster Defence Regiment, a part of the security forces. There's a whole history to this, which I can't go into. But suffice it to tell you that young Noel Bell, a Protestant, told me that he was so badly beaten, he signed a confession for something he did not do. There is a growing consensus of opinion in the north of Ireland that this case must be retried. And when this case is retried, God grant not only will these four young men be released, but it will show to the world that our laws are unjust and unfair and that they must be changed. We must work for human rights. You see, it's wrong to say to people to take the gun to bring about change. That's the wrong way. But sometimes using a gun seems to be the only way when governments won't move to be fair and just. So we campaign for repeal of emergency laws. We campaign for many basic civil liberties. We visit the prisons and we work for prison reforms. We also try to say that we need investment in Northern Ireland. We need jobs, 17% unemployment in our country, and in the hardest hit areas, 70% unemployment. How can people have dignity? How can they have a stake in society, a sense of hope, when there's 70% unemployment in one area alone, where the army and the police go around searching homes, where it looks like nothing is ever going to be any different. We must give hope not only to the people of Northern Ireland in saying we will work for social justice. 
we must give hope to the people of the world. But there's a choice to be made. The choice is between does the human family want to walk the road of militarism or does it want to walk the road of social justice? We can't do both. We haven't got the resources, the intelligence, the brains to do, deal with the social justice issues and at the same time to keep wasting it on disarmament. The choice must be made and we must come off the road of disarmament and begin to tackle the problems of social justice if the human family is to survive. And so we work with the youth, with families of the prisoners, through the ways of non-violent justice and human rights. And we are hopeful because we believe that we are only part of a growing movement around the world of the human family saying we want to walk on a new road. And we thank you in America who have given us great examples through the American peace movement. We have taken our examples from you. And we thank you for that. And we ask you to pray for us. And we ask you the price of peace is dedication, hard work, courage, and total commitment. Are you prepared to pay the price of peace? Thank you very much. Lloyd Anderson has the privilege of the first question. Lloyd? Do you see the, that one of the contributors to uh, peace in Northern Ireland, a political solution that is changes in, in the way the political arrangements exist from now? Well, in the North of Ireland, our political parties are uh, sectarian based. Um, we have uh, Catholics voting for the Catholic parties and we have Protestants voting for the Protestant parties. And for um, over 60 years now in the North, we have had uh, Protestant majority rule refusing to share power with the minority. Um, now, that still stands in our situation. There is a total block of political movement. The politicians won't share power. As long as that, that situation stands, the only alternative for people such as our, ourselves is to say that we have to create political consensus across the base of our community. And we have to build a new base for this political consensus. Now that has to be done slowly, but in the ways that we and many, many other organizations, we are a small organization, but there are many people working in those ways is to be done slowly in bringing people together so that they can become friends, that the fear barrier can come down, that they can begin to look with a great deal of more clarity and a little bit more peacefully at what the real uh, problems are and how we can together really begin to solve them. So that is the way that we are working with the situation. And God grant out of this community, the healed community will come the political consensus for what our new institutions may finally be. To help that process, uh, there are steps that can be taken by the government uh, in that the, the, the like of uh, uh, changing the emergency laws um, at the moment in some areas, the communities are very quickly moving towards peace. But tragically, there are still very high numbers of soldiers in those communities. Uh, and we would like to see a de-escalation of the soldiers into barracks to allow the community to come back, be healed and move forward together. So there are steps that can be taken. But essentially, the solution to the Northern Ireland problem cannot be imposed from the top down by either the British or the Irish government. It is a problem of relationships 
amongst the people in Northern Ireland, and it must come with a healing of those relationships. Mark Anderson, Chair of the Arts and Culture Standing Committee. Mark? Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. You have talked a little bit about culture and the problems and differences of culture. What I'd like to do is address some of the arts. Many, many artists here in the United States and throughout the world are forming groups together and trying to get together and really forward the peace movement, not, not just through fundraisers, but really singing for peace, making their goal peace in the world. And I'd like you to comment upon the role, if any, of artists in Ireland to help forward that and your view as to how that helps. Well, there is a great movement of artists recognizing that uh, they have great gifts and talents and can go into the, the peace movement. Um, uh, one, one friend of mine who is an artist, um, uh, every year some of us as Christians undertake a 40-day fast and prayer for the truth of Christian nonviolence in Ireland. And two of the young people in this are artists and they have uh, dedicated their gift uh, in trying to, uh, through the arts, portray uh, non-violence. Uh, so they do it through using their, their art uh, media um, and looking at how can we produce media stuff which appeals to children, which teaches our children to have respect for life and respect for the environment. Uh, and this is a growing movement of artists recognizing that peace starts in the heart and in the home with our young children and really trying to get them to think a new way. You see, we recognize that we have gained the knowledge of how to make conventional nuclear weapons and when man gains knowledge, he can't just throw it away. Uh, it would be hard to change this uh, knowledge, but what we can change is the false idea, indeed the lie, in the human mind that we have a right to kill each other. It is a lie that we have a right to kill each other. L life is a gift. It's given freely to us. Uh, we have a right to rejoice and celebrate it, and no one has a right to take it. And by the law of natural justice, we have no right to take another human life. Now, if we start unmasking that lie by teaching our little children that life is sacred, and, and they must celebrate and never touch anyone. I mean, through the arts, the arts have a wonderful contribution to that, 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 that movement of beginning to think in a new way. So thank you for your question, and most certainly it is a growing movement in Ireland. Jean DeMaster, City Club member. Let me ask a question in terms of the... Oh, Okay, let me ask a question. In terms of the history that you were talking about, you spoke earlier of 200 years of kind of recorded Christian history, of 200 years of not sanctioning war, and then 1,700 years of sanctioning war, and particularly with war breaking out all around the world right now. What is it about the time period that we're in, or the, the people that we are, that you think that now some kind of change is going to occur. I, I couldn't agree with you more that it should occur, but why do we believe that now it's going to occur? What is it about us that can make it occur when for 1,700 years and all over the world it just isn't happening? Well, <clears throat> well I, I think the fact that for 300 years, our early Christian history, um, Christians could not be a soldier and be a Christian. One of the early Christian writings, the book of Hippolytus, uh, it says quite clearly that you couldn't be in the army and, and be a Christian at the same time. Now that has changed down through the centuries, but I, through, through the centuries we have always had people who have reminded us um, of where our roots were, like in St. Francis and many, many more. But, you know, people have said that what has happened in the Eastern Bloc countries came fast, but it didn't come fast. It was many men, women and, and children for many, many years being prepared to pay the price of peace. Men who went to prison and suffered and uh, people who wrote letters in little places far away from it to say this things should change. So it was a whole build up that really bought, brought down the, bil the Berlin Wall. And I think that bu build up is happening in right around our world. And I do believe 
uh, that it is going to uh, come quickly to the surface and maybe even faster than we can realise. And I think part and what will be a great contribution to that will be the role that men will play. You see, um, for a, a long time, the peace movement has been made up with people such as myself, volunteer movements, trying to struggle and little people no money, and it seemed to be something women did. I remember coming on a plane in the early days to America and sitting beside a businessman, and he asked me, well, what is your career? And I said, I'm a peace activist. And he says, I know, but how do you make your money? You know, so it was this idea that it's a hobby. It's, it's a bit of a joke. It's something women do when there's nothing better to do. You know, well, I tell you, I have five children, and my heart is with my children. And it's a sacrifice for me to be sitting here today. My heart is in Khalif with my little children. But because I believe that the world is crying out in pain, crying out to us in pain, I'm here today. So we can all do something. And what men can do, and women can help them, we women have created this macho image that the real man is the man who will protect us. And, and, and we, get him, we, we put him into the mold that he's got to go to war and he's got to fight his country and that's the real heroic thing to do. And we let them go to war and God knows when they die. We put their picture on the piano and we look at it and we die slowly inside, not ever really wanting them to go to war. So somehow we've got to liberate our men from this macho image and say, we want gentle men. We want men who can show really courage, who can do what the Chinese students stood up and said, I'll die before I'll kill. You know, that's the real courage, to be prepared to die rather than to kill another human person. Because I'm not taken away from the courage of the men, the women in the Gulf today. They are courageous. But sometimes, too, we pressurize them into going out and doing this, and they go along with the thinking and the tide. The real courage is a man and woman who stands out and says, hey, hold on a minute, there's something wrong here. And we know your Senator Hatfield has taken a stand here, and maybe just a few lone voices, but we give credit to the peace movement of Oregon, who has a man standing now and saying, hey, hold, hold on here a minute. Maybe there's a way of dealing, this, dealing with this. Let's think it through. You know, so, you know, I, I think to create a kind of a new thinking, a new way forward for the human family, is going to take people who are going to stand up with courage. And if we've got to die, we've got to die. You know, we've got to be prepared to pay that price because what is happening in our world is exciting and it is new and we can make it happen. And everybody can do some little thing. Uh, my name is Liam Callan. Uh, I'm a City Club member. You know, when I heard you were coming, I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious, this is a sincere question, I thought, oh my God, she's still around, you know? Uh, if this isn't, you know, this isn't new for you. You've been working at this for a while, and and my honest question is, how is it going? You know, and I'm not saying you should stop if you're all by yourself working at what you're working at. I think that's fine, but I wondered how, what, what do you feel? There's any movement and progress? Well, <clears throat> you see, I, I'd like to say to you that everybody looks for results. And, and they like to see how the projects are going and, and, and the developments and all that are taking place. And that's a very human thing. You know, but I think those of us who have put our hand to the plow of creating a nonviolent world or societies which are built on respect for life and respect for the environment recognize this as a vision. You know, somebody said to me a few days ago, that's John Lennon stuff. <laughs> <laughs> our vision, we mightn't live to see it, but we've put our hand to the plow. And that's all right because, again, I think uh, we're not asked, God doesn't ask us for success. God asks us to do our very best, as best we can, and really leave the rest up to him and, and he'll bring the result in his own good time. And that liberates you from the ne need to have to lift your pr list your progr programs and show you how successful you are. So we operate in that way, but we really have had the privilege of seeing, even in our own time, a great 
decrease in the violence. You see, in Northern Ireland, a total of 82 people died. Now, 78 of them were killed by the IRA, so that is a startling statistic for those who would support the use of violence to bring about change. But we regard that as too many people to die, but it is an incredible decrease in, from where we found ourselves in 1976 and 1977, and we feel that we are moving into peace. But the thing that will be our real enemy as we move into peace is apathy. You see, we are up against a lot of apathy because in Northern Ireland we have people who are very poor and we have people who are doing all right, thank you very much. They live on the other side of the fence with a couple of cars at the door and good jobs and their attitude is if you could get all these gunmen and lock them up then everything would be all right. You know, and that's what we are up against, that apathy amongst people who are rich living in our community. We need them, and we need them to realize that the poor need them as well. You see, when we talk about peace and development, we need to link on justice. Because if development doesn't mean that there's an equal sharing out of the riches, and that the poor have enough and, a part, and, and play their part in the whole of society, then development is no use to us. It only means we're getting a society where some have far too much and those have absolutely nothing. So really, we have to keep encouraging all of our people to, with generosity, move forward to create institutions which are fair and just for all. Kay Durham, City Club member. Your winning of the Nobel Peace Prize Peace Prize is exemplary. What's been the biggest change in your life since you won it? Well, I, I really can't think of, of, um, of anything because in a sense, I, I, I'm just, I still have to do the same things, you know. I get up in the morning like everybody else. <laughs> You know, and I have five children, and my husband's a motor mechanic, and I just get, have to get the kids out to school, and I, I get my husband's dinner, and he goes off to, to, to work, and I wash the dishes like everybody else, and, and, uh, and, and just get on with things. So, you know, it, it, uh, and I don't have a maid. <laughs> so, in a sense, not, nothing like that has changed. I don't know if that answers it, but I'm trying <laughs> to... <laughs> well, did it make your job easier? <laughs> oh, I mean, yes, you yes, got some yes, notoriety? Yes, yes, of course, of course. It made it. When I received the Nobel Prize, I cried because I, I realized that it's a heavy responsibility, you know, and, and to, to, the, to the day I die, I realize that as a Nobelist, if a little letter falls through my letterbox saying, come and help us in Latin America, um, you know, I'll be torn between uh, leaving the kids and leaving Jackie and going to Latin America maybe to help people living, you know, in much, much worse situations. Now, in saying that, I mean, I at the most travel two to three weeks out of the year. I'm, I'm, I'm at home looking after my children and helping them little way as I can. But that is, that is the responsibility that I will carry because being a Nobelist literally opens up a world platform to be able to talk about the ideas on non-violence. So when I cheered up a little bit and I realized that all the privileges of being a Nobelist, like um, coming to the Portland City Club and having my dinner cooked for me, <laughs> <laughs> and sitting beside the bishop. <laughs> I mean, it has brought such, such wonderful opportunities and such lovely memories. And we literally have friends all around the world because, you know, when I came in today, now Lisa Harper, who's here, Lisa came up and greeted me. Lisa came to Belfast and worked with the, the CA, the, the, the Committee on Administration of Justice and worked with the peace people. So literally when we come to America, we have friends who've been to Belfast and back here. Uh, and uh, we, we have friends all over the world now. So it has been a tremendous privilege uh, to receive the Nobel, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Tremendous privilege. Kathy Oxborough, City Club member. 
What is the best response that the American people could make to the people in Northern Ireland, and what response would not be helpful? The best response the people of America can make to the people of Northern Ireland is to insist to their government that not a shot be fired in the Gulf and that this problem be solved through the United Nations. And then when that is done, to insist that the Middle East, the Israeli problem, be helped to be solved non-violently. To see that Kuwait gets some kind of a democracy. To bring home the military. To start demilitarization and finding jobs for the young men who have been trained for war so that their intelligence may be used to build houses for the poor, to go food for the hungry, to begin to see how we can stop planet Earth from dying because let's face, Mother Earth is dying. The scientists tell us that maybe we've got 80 years, 80 years, in other words, your children's children will inherit a planet that is uninhabitable. Doesn't that just make you think? But we can turn that around if quickly we can get the money out of militarism and get the money into the real enemies of the human family, environment, pervasive poverty, third world debt, human rights, development and justice. We can deal with these issues because America has sent men to the moon when we said it couldn't be done. To help Northern Ireland, you show us that the Gulf crises can be solved in a new way because then you put the human family on a new course. Then you prove that we can use non-violence to solve our problems. And after that, the sky's the limit. Now it's time for a written question. What is the role being played presently by the British government in resolving the conflict in Ireland in a non-violent way? Well, you know, if you ask that question of all the governments in the world, the answer has got to be nothing. <laughs> because we don't know how to do things in a non-violent way. It's a, whole new, it's a whole new ball game, as they say in America. <laughs> we really have to quickly begin to look at how we can do it in a non-violent way. And how we can build institutions that are built that can solve these problems non-violently. You see, I'm not arguing that we have no right to self-defense. I am arguing that we have a right to non-violent self-defense. And how do we build that? Well, now you take Ireland for an example. In Ireland, we have a small army in the south. And if America wanted to invade Ireland, can you believe it? There's no way that small army could hold off America. No way. But if we disarmed, and if Ireland was a genuine Christian country, as Patrick would have wanted it to be, we could look at maybe how to train our people in nonviolent civilian defense. We could teach the women and the men how to let the tires down on all the tanks, <laughs> cut all the telephone wires, Refuse to give the American soldiers a good Guinness in the pub when they come in for one. <laughs> I mean, we just haven't used our imagination in thinking how it can be done because we've never begun to think in this way. So what we're saying is let's start thinking in this way. Let's start putting some of our resources into conflict resolution. Let's put some of them into non-violent civilian defense. Let's start setting up sections in our universities that look at these alternatives because we haven't got the answer. And so for the British government, and you know, it's time that we too begun to think the British and the Irish have a lot in common. And with the emigration of our young men 
every day from the north of Ireland, more and more Irish people are now in England. And we need to try to build the, the relationships there deeper. But with the British government in Northern Ireland, it can only be said with, with truth that the most of their policies have been a disaster. We would like to think that with a bit of imagination that the government could move to restoring, removing emergency laws and restoring many of our basic civil liberties. That would be a start. That the government could move towards putting more money into education and into investment because our industrial base is collapsing and our education system is getting worse. So we need all these things but there has got to be a change of mind amongst the leadership in Britain that we have people with imagination saying that it's not the answer to send the troops out to the Gulf, but the answer is to find ways of getting that done, releasing the resources and putting the money into trying to rebuild our social and economic and political structures, both in England and in the north of Ireland. Carlene Kraft, member, you suggest creative solutions for solving the problems of the world, and particularly in Northern Ireland, you mentioned uh, building relationships between the people rather than looking to the politicians for solutions. Do you see that there is a way that that can be accomplished practically, and can you compare that to the situation in Israel with the Palestinians? Is that possible, building relationships there, and is there a parallel that you see? <clears throat> well, um, I, I think that um, the parallel between Northern Ireland and between now in the Palestinian and the Israeli situation is that you have the fear there. Again, I don't believe that, that people hate each other. It is a fear thing. Um, you also have in both situations the implementation of emergency legislation amongst the minority community. Uh, and um, where you implement emergency laws upon people, uh, they, the anger and the frustration builds up to a situation where people become violent. And this has been proven in Northern Ireland. Um, one young man in our prison said to me that he reckons as high as 90% of those who joined the IRA and are now in prison, it was a reaction to something that happened in their community. Uh, and so emergency laws do not work. They erode totally respect for law and order. Um, I think the situation could also apply in Israel, where again you see the, uh, emer the emergency laws being implemented and young Palestinians reacting with violence. Uh, so if, Palestine, if Israel can take any example from us in Northern Ireland or any message, we say to them, you know, restore proper justice uh, and give the, the uh, and through the means of dialogue uh, and negotiation, begin to solve the, the problem in their country. So there are some instances, but again, uh, many many differences. And I must say, I don't know the situation well enough to be able in Israel to be able to go into it. But I feel we have a lot in common. You see, I think this fear thing is very important, and I'm hoping that. More and more people will be taught about fear, the anatomy of fear. It's very important that people um, uh, with brains begin to really look at this for us and help us on this issue, how to cope with it. Um, because um, in Northern Ireland, when the walls went up between Catholics and Protestants, um, uh, people on both sides believed there were guns on both sides of the community. And when the, that word went round, the fear really rose to such a pitch that people on one side of the community literally walked all across the wall to, to, and burnt people out of their homes. In 1969, Christian people, people who'd normally not do anything like that, were so fearful that they were going to be shot, took, uh, took torches and went along and burnt people out of their homes. Now, I know you think that's ridiculous, but I would say to you, if you lived in a situation, there's chances that you might well do something like that. And it did happen. But once we begin to say there's no guns here um, they, 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 and begin to take down the fear barrier, then people with a bit more rationality 
could begin to look at the issue. And maybe that little example applies something to the, to the Gulf War thing. Is there a way in which we can make, take action that brings down the fear there, that allows people to look at the problems with a little bit more uh, calmness, if you like? Um, so while there are great similarities, uh, I, I'm, uh, I know there are also great difficulties. Differences, sorry. Yeah. Please join me in thanking our speaker for today. <laughs>